Chapter Two of Bushido, the Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awaii in November two thousand and nine. Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Two, Sources of Bushido. In Japan, there were several sources of Bushido, of which I may begin with Buddhism. It furnished a sense of calm trust in faith a quiet submission to the inevitable, that stoic composure in sight of danger or calamity, that disdain of life and friendliness with death. A foremost teacher of swordmanship, when he saw his pupil master the utmost of his art, told him, Beyond this my instruction must give way to Zen teaching. Zen is the Japanese equivalent for the dhyana, which represents human effort to reach through meditation zones of thought beyond the range of verbal expression. Its method is contemplation, and its purport, as far as I understand it, to be convinced of a principle that underlies all phenomena, and, if it can, of the absolute itself, and thus to put oneself in harmony with this absolute. Thus defined, the teaching was more than the dogma of a sect, and whoever attains to the perception of the absolute raises himself above mundane things and awakes to a new heaven and a new earth what buddhism failed to give shintoism offered in abundance such loyalty to the sovereign such reverence for ancestral memory and such filial piety as are not taught by any other creed were inculcated by the shinto doctrines imparting passivity to the otherwise arrogant character of the samurai shinto theology has no place for the dogma of original sin on the contrary it believes in the innate goodness and godlike purity of the human soul adoring it as the adytum from which divine oracles are proclaimed everybody has observed that the shinto shrines are conspicuously devoid of objects and instruments of worship and that a plain mirror hung in the sanctuary forms the essential part of its furnishing. The presence of this article is easy to explain. It typifies the human heart, which, when perfectly placid and clear, reflects the very image of the deity. When you stand, therefore, in front of the shrine to worship, you see your own image reflected on its shining surface, and the act of worship is tantamount to the old Delphic injunction know thyself but self-knowledge does not imply either in the greek or japanese teaching knowledge of the physical part of man not his anatomy or his psychophysics knowledge was to be of a moral kind the introspection of our moral nature mommsen comparing the greek and the roman says that when the former worshipped he raised his eyes to heaven for his prayer was contemplation while the latter veiled his head for his was reflection our reflection brought into prominence not so much the moral as the national consciousness of the individual its nature worship endeared the country to our inmost souls while its ancestor worship tracing from lineage to lineage made the imperial family the fountainhead of the whole nation to us the country is more than land and soil from which to mine gold or to reap grain it is the sacred abode of the gods the spirits of our forefathers to us the emperor is more than the arch-constable of a rechtsstaat or even the patron of a kulturstaat he is bodily representative of heaven on earth blending in his person its power and its mercy if what mr butmi says is true of english royalty that it is not only the image of authority but the author and symbol of national unity as i believe it to be doubly and trebly may this be affirmed of royalty in japan the tenets of shintoism cover the two predominating features of the emotional life of our race patriotism and loyalty arthur may knapp in feudal and modern japan very truly says in hebrew literature it is often difficult to tell whether the writer is speaking of god or of the commonwealth of heaven or of Jerusalem, of the Messiah or of the nation itself. A similar confusion may be noticed in the nomenclature of our national faith. I said confusion because it will be so deemed by a logical intellect on account of its verbal ambiguity. 
Still, being a framework of national instinct and race feelings, Shintoism never pretends to a systematic philosophy or a rational theology. This religion, or is it not more correct to say the race emotions which this religion expressed, thoroughly imbued Bushido with loyalty to the sovereign and love of country. These acted more as impulses than as doctrines, for Shintoism, unlike the medieval Christian church, prescribed to its votaries scarcely any credenda, furnishing them at the same time with agenda of a straightforward and simple type. As to strictly ethical doctrines, the teachings of Confucius were the most prolific source of Bushido. His enunciation of the five moral relations between master and servant, the governing and the governed, father and son, husband and wife, older and younger brother, and between friend and friend, was but a confirmation of what the race instinct had recognized before his writings were introduced from China. The calm, benignant, and worldly-wise character of his politico-ethical precepts was particularly well suited to the samurai who formed the ruling class. His aristocratic and conservative tone was well adapted to the requirements of these warrior statesmen. Next to Confucius, Mencius exercised an immense authority over Bushido. His forcible and often quite democratic theories were exceedingly taking to sympathetic natures, and they were even thought dangerous to, and subversive of, the existing social order, hence his works were for a long time under censure. Still, the words of this mastermind found permanent lodgment in the heart of the samurai. The writings of Confucius and Mencius formed the principal textbooks for youths and the highest authority in discussion among the old. A mere acquaintance with the classics of these two sages was held, however, in no high esteem. A common proverb ridicules one who has only an intellectual knowledge of Confucius as a man ever studious but ignorant of analects. A typical samurai calls a literary servant a book-smelling sot. Another compares learning to an ill-smelling vegetable that must be boiled and boiled before it is fit for use. A man who has read a little smells a little pedantic, and a man who has read much smells yet more so. Both are alike unpleasant. The writer meant thereby that knowledge becomes really such only when it is assimilated in the mind of the learner and shows in his character. An intellectual specialist was considered a machine. Intellect itself was considered subordinate to ethical emotion. Man and the universe were conceived to be alike, spiritual and ethical. Bushido could not accept the judgment of Huxley that the cosmic process was unmoral. Bushido made light of knowledge as such. It was not pursued as an end in itself, but as a means to the attainment of wisdom. Hence, he who stopped short of this end was regarded no higher than a convenient machine, which could turn out poems and maxims at bidding. Thus, knowledge was conceived as identical with its practical application in life, and the Socratic doctrine found its greatest exponent in the Chinese philosopher Wan Yang Ming, who never wearies of repeating, to know and to act are one and the same. I beg leave for a moment's digression while I am on this subject, inasmuch as some of the noblest types of Bushi were strongly influenced by the teachings of this sage. Western readers will easily recognize in his writings many parallels to the New Testament. Making allowance for the terms peculiar to either teaching, the passage, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, conveys a thought that may be found on almost any page of one young Ming. A Japanese disciple, Miwa Shisai, of his says, The Lord of heaven and earth, of all living beings, dwelling in the heart of man, becomes his mind, Kokoro. Hence, a mind is a living thing and is ever luminous. And again, The spiritual light of our essential being is pure and is not affected by the will of man. Spontaneously springing up in our mind, it shows what is right and wrong, it is then called conscience. It is even the light that proceedeth from the God of heaven. How very much do these words sound like some passages from Isaac Pennington or other philosophic mystics. 
I am inclined to think that the Japanese mind, as expressed in the simple tenets of the Shinto religion, was particularly open to the reception of Yang Ming's precepts. He carried his doctrine of the infallibility of conscience to extreme transcendentalism, attributing to it the faculty to perceive not only the distinction between right and wrong, but also the nature of psychical facts and physical phenomena. He went as far as, if not farther than, Berkeley and Fichte, in idealism denying the existence of things outside of human ken. If his system had all the logical errors charged to solipsism, it had all the efficacy of strong conviction and its moral import in developing individuality of character and equanimity of temper cannot be gainsaid. Thus, whatever the sources, the essential principles which Bushido imbibed from them and assimilated to itself were few and simple. Few and simple as these were, they were sufficient to furnish a safe conduct of life even through the unsafest days of the most unsettled period of our nation's history. The wholesome, unsophisticated nature of our warrior ancestors derived ample food for their spirit from a sheaf of commonplace and fragmentary teachings, gleaned as it were on the highways and byways of ancient thought, and, stimulated by the demands of the age, formed from these gleanings a new and unique type of manhood. An acute French savant, Monsieur de la Mazelière, thus sums up his impressions of the 16th century. Toward the middle of the 16th century, all is confusion in Japan, in the government, in society, in the church. But the civil wars, the manners returning to barbarism, the necessity for each to execute justice for himself, these formed men comparable to those Italians of the 16th century in whom Taine praises the vigorous initiative, the habit of sudden resolutions and desperate undertakings, the grand capacity to do and to suffer. In Japan as in Italy, the rude manners of the Middle Ages made of man a superb animal, wholly militant and wholly resistant. And this is why the 16th century displays in the highest degree the principal quality of the Japanese race, that great diversity which one finds there between minds, esprits, as well as between temperaments. While in India and even in China, men seem to differ chiefly in degree of energy or intelligence, in Japan they differ by originality of character as well. Now, individuality is the sign of superior races and of civilizations already developed. If we make use of an expression dear to Nietzsche, we might say that in Asia, to speak of humanity is to speak of its plains, in Japan as in Europe, one represents it above all by its mountains. End of chapter 2